Thank you again, everyone, for uh, joining us today. Beautiful Chicago weather. It's like this all year round. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, all, all kidding aside, thank you for joining us. Great, grateful to see a lot of uh, people we've seen on Zoom and meet them in person. Grateful to have a global uh, innovator join us here in Chicago to have these meaningful conversations today. Um, we do come together under this unifying belief that Web3 is today and now. It is inevitable. And that, you know, in this room, um, we have the power to transform how this technology can impact uh, our society. Um, as much as we live and breathe Web3, we are still so early. AI is a 40-year technology. Uh, arguably, uh, you know, Bitcoin's a... 13-year technology, 15-year technology. We're still early. A lot of uh, today's internet still has challenges. Challenges around centralization of power. Challenges around um, creator economies and, and the revenue share that is being debated right now in the Hollywood strikes. Um, arguably, that there is um, you know, not the business models that align purpose and responsible innovation. Um, in this room, we, we do have the opportunity to fix and create this next generation internet. You know, we, we do call this the Web3. Um, Brian mentioned earlier what's, what's so uh, cleansing about today's bear market is we, we are building a healthier ecosystem. Um, you know, I've been an investor for 20 plus years third bear market for the internet, my fifth uh, bear market for crypto. Um, you know, just as much as there's overhype and in bull markets things get too frenzied, you know, in the bear markets you, you also see uh, the overcorrection happening. And it's the overcorrection that sorts out the flyby nights, it, it leads the durable innovators, the durable use cases, and um, with, with today's bear market, I think we're going to reemerge with a healthier technology adoption. Uh, today is, from a venture investor perspective, uh, a market of substance over hype. Yeah. Substance is being rewarded right now. You'll hear from a lot of panelists today about how they are building this proof of adoption. Uh, today is a market of show me and not build it and they will come. You know, show me the proof, show me that use case. Uh, Danny, Laura, and I at DexScient, we work on uh, a product market fit and then emerging token market fit. You know, where is that fit? How does it impact society? Um, and then lastly, you know, healthier markets come from the normalization of venture capital in this space, fewer distortions of less overfunding. We're back to normalizing towards uh, you know, at least on a deal count basis, uh, 2020 levels, valuations are corrected and normalized to 2013 levels. We're seeing AI drive capital efficiency so you can get products and tokens to market with less capital. And, and for seed stage investors, for uh, venture capitalists, that capital efficiency rewards those who can ship and iterate very quickly. In this room, we do have this power to shape uh, Web3, the next generation internet, the immersive internet. Uh, I have so much respect for the people in this room building you know, the open finance, the inclusive finance that allows for permissionless access to the financial system to remove some of the middlemen in between loans and payments across borders. Uh, a lot of respect for the people building the durable use cases for house commerce or, or gaming. Um, a lot of respect for uh, the people building the spatial computing internet, the, the immersive internet, or clickbaity metaverse. Um, yeah, and, and certainly um, AI is transforming all industries, Web3 included, the next generation internet included. There are pockets of substance versus hype. Um, you will see the AI panel later on today. Of, uh, these are truly good leaders, amazing leaders with that ethical bounds to build AI plus the internet for a positive impact. Um, I, I know most of you in this room, and, and I know 
the ethical approach towards responsible innovation. And th this is uh, something that um, we've been very deliberate at Decasonic in curating our ecosystem, our investor base. Um, apropos, we wanted to kick off this conference uh, about this conversation of our duty around responsible innovation, around uh, leadership in Web3. It's the people in this room that uh, have the high responsibility of the power of Web3 to deploy that power for uh, positive synergies in, in society. Um, uh, I'm blessed with uh, an investor base at Decasonic with a long-term perspective. Um, they've been very committed to our thesis around mainstream adoption of Web3. Uh, this allows us to cascade our long-term approach to working with founders. You'll, you'll meet a bunch of our portfolio companies here that have demo done. And you know, anchoring our investor base is uh, the Pritzker organization, a uh, storied, uh, long-term, multi-generational uh, enterprise. Jason Pritzker is on our board, and, and I'm honored to bring him up on stage to engage in this conversation around leadership in Web3. Uh, could you kind of share some of those um, perspectives and, and your background, and why, why you're interested in technology? Our yeah. family has been investing for the better part of 80 years alongside great partners. And kind of our North Star and, um, and focus in business is being around great leaders. We feel that if you can get into uh, a partnership with people that want to build over the long term and want to um, kind of put one foot in front of the other and make the right decision every day, that's what's going to create success over a long period of time. Uh, and so for the last, call it last 20 years, we've been doing that largely on the private equity side of things. I call it private equity because it's kind of larger scale, mature businesses, um, and we use leverage. But when we get into a new partnership with a team, our intention and our hope is to be partners with them for a very, very long time. Uh, a couple of years ago, we decided that we didn't have early stage competence in-house. We're direct investors. We don't do a lot of fund investing. We have another arm that does fund investing. Um, and wanted to develop in-house competence around early stage under the, with the thesis that we're pretty good at late stage investing in partnership. If we can get really good at early stage investing in partnership, um, that would create even more differentiation in our platform and the ability for us to be better partners across the spectrum and life cycle of companies. Uh, so for the last couple of years, we've been focused, in addition to the later stage effort, on very early stage investing. Um, we have the luxury of, of time and flexibility with our capital, and so we wanted to enter the market slowly. Uh, we thought the first kind of phase of that should be to partner with great people that are running their own funds that can have subject matter expertise around various parts within the technology ecosystem. And that's how we met. We sized up uh, crypto and Web3 and where it was going and said, we're not smart enough to do this. We need to find a partner that um, wants to be in this ecosystem long term and that can teach us along the way. And so that's how we met and partnered. I'm thrilled to be in business with Paul uh, for the Thank last you. couple of years. Yeah. And we're in it for, for the long term, as you were saying before we came out there. Yeah, Jay, Jason, one, one of our first conversations when, when we first met was when, when you operate for the long term, you, you go through market cycles. Yeah. Bear, bear markets, bull markets. Um, in, in your experience, what, what are some of these lessons from bear markets that we could apply to leadership? Right. So. Um, so I have to say, I, when, when Paul asked me to speak on this subject, is Paul, I'm not that old. I haven't lived through that bear market, so. So he says, right? I'm tell a story. Um, but But when we started talking about it, I think the most relevant one is actually is Hyatt Hotels, which isn't, isn't a boom market today, but uh, coming out of COVID, um, 
there were a couple of years that were, were really tough. Um, and and I, well, my lesson from that, I'm, a, I'm on the board of directors of Hyatt, so I don't have an operational role, but there, you can imagine during COVID, it was all hands on deck all the time. Um, and what got us through that was, was, I'd say, largely two things. A focus on our purpose. So at, at Hyatt, our purpose is we care for people so they can be their best. We care for you so you can be their best. That is not a kitschy kind of saying that you see on a wall. People live and breathe that purpose every single day. And whether it's a 51-49 decision or a 90-10 kind of decision, nothing's rarely do you have something that's 100% do this or do that. Uh, that's the lens through which we, we filter our decisions. Having that organizing principle was very, very powerful. Um, and we found opportunities day by day to express that purpose statement. And so whatever that purpose statement is for you, whether it's in your personal life or in your business, having that kind of rallying cry in a bear market when you're getting pounded with bad news every day uh, is, is incredibly valuable. And then the second thing um, is adopting an agile mindset. You know, and, that, and that's probably true whether you're in a bear market or a bull market today, the pace of change and in information uh, is increasing every day. But during a bear market, and in fact, this was something we talked about a year ago at our um, in investor conference, we had a portfolio summit, Paul spoke, and this was largely called it 20th century businesses. And Paul gave a great 45 minute lecture on Web3, on crypto, and just really blockchain uh, to construction companies and steel guys and people that don't have to engage with it every day. And one of the questions in the end was like, okay, so what do we do with all this? And Paul's answer I thought was brilliant, and it's the same one I'm gonna give, which is just be agile. Be, be willing to learn, be nimble, and um, don't be afraid to adjust and update your business model or thinking about things. I think in a bear market, there are a lot of opportunities. And as you're seeing in this space, um, you know, that you separate the wheat from the chaff. Yep. And, and that Absolutely. creates a ton of opportunities. If you have relative scale in your business, um, there are others that are feeling the pain as well. There, there are opportunities there. If, um, if you're trying to grow in a business and there are less competitors, that's an opportunity. So finding those opportunities, reacting to them, and, um, and being agile, I think, is, is really a, an important part. And, and, and so, so much of purpose and agility has defined our partnership and relationship, Jason. I, I, I pride myself on writing our monthly letters, you know, engaging with you on monthly calls, updating you on our iterations of what's going on. You know, certainly we operate in Web3 where things evolve so quickly. <laughs> and, you know, what, what worked yesterday may not work tomorrow. Um, but then it'll work again the day after. That. <laughs> it's like you're only as good as your next thing in, in many respects. You're also investors in other venture funds too, specifically. And, and what, what, what are you seeing in that partnership that you know, founders can draw? What, how are you seeing successful uh, LPGP relationships? Yeah, so we, we did a piece of that what Paul's referring to is in, in the first phase of getting an venture, we seeded and anchored a few funds. Um, we wanted to learn how to be good venture investors, which is very different than being a good private equity scale investor. They're just the competency. They couldn't be more different, and if you make the mistake of thinking you're good at venture because you're good at PE, <laughs> you end up doing bad deals right. and, and not being a value-add partner. So we did a number of uh, LP investments. We're no longer doing that. We're, we've now kind of built the team out to do direct investing. But, um, but what I'd say is an important thing um, for us in those communities and, and, and engaging those people is to have that student mindset. We were talking about this. Is, I'll always be learning. Don't ever think you know everything about everything. Um, and so we see a little bit of, um, we've, seen, we've seen one or two that, that haven't kind of accepted that things are different. They're kind of charging the same way they were. And, um, and at least in our view, they're kind of falling behind a little bit. 
and those that are leaning into change and understanding that there's opportunity are doing really well. You know, the, the, the humility of being an investor in, in market cycles is that you, you think you know everything and then you, you have to relearn it again. And yeah. it, it's always that constant adaption and then action oriented. I think we, we've really partnered well. Yeah, it, it's an organizing principle for us. It's student mindset. You never want to be the master. You want to be the student. You want to, you want to just continually be learning and then find ways to apply that wisdom on behalf of your partners. Well, one thing we, we think about at Dexonic is rapid short-term iterations with a long-term direction. Can, can you talk a little bit more about kind of how you think about building for the long term? You know, certainly a lot of your private equity portfolio, a lot of your relationships span generations. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, I have so much respect for that generational mindset. You know, I think about our daughters and that, them embracing science at the Science Museum. Um, you know, how, how can we apply that to, to business at Web3? Yeah. Um, life is long, you know, uh, and we've all heard analogies about what a misstep can do for your career. Um, our view, at least, is um, to, to plan for long term, you just have to make the right small decisions each day. And Things like legacy or impact or responsibility to communities, which, you know, Paul, we should all give Paul a huge, not right now, but <laughs> and round of applause, and, and we owe a debt of gratitude to you for what you're doing for Chicago. Um, because that is a long-term pursuit, but you can't just snap your fingers and say, I want this to be a hub of activity long-term. It takes that daily commitment that you have to, to Web3 and blockchain um, um, to, to get it done. And so our view is um, long-term happens as the accumulation of a lot of small decisions, not a, um, not a, a grand plan necessarily. Um, there's nothing better than having great partners and being excited when you show up to a meeting or to the office. I feel like I'm the luckiest guy around because I love my team, I love uh, all my external and internal partners, and so if I can surround myself with great people all the time, that will lead to a long-term uh, engagement or um, focus on business. We're, we're on the record, I'm still a Warriors fan, not a Bulls fan. <laughs> <laughs> I love Chicago, but not, not so. Yeah. We have a consistent <laughs> back and forth. I thought the sun was setting. Yeah. Uh, that Steph Curry and, fan. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that that's a transition towards, uh, you, know, you, you, you and I always talk about the commitment to excellence. And, and you know, I, I think about the daily iterations and improvements that the 1% every day gets you a 32x gain over time. That, that's the compounding effect of keeping a high bar for people you work with, the expectations you set for yourself, and then how you cascade that to your, your, your team, your ecosystem, and then the broader community. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit more about the winning culture, you know, Bulls and, and, and Golden State, but certainly it, it cascades into communities and, and business, too. You know, it's interesting. I, I've seen a bunch of different ones. There, there are a lot of different ways to win. It kind of goes back to that purpose statement. You know, our, our, we own a large construction company that, um, that's been successful uh, over a number of years. It's very much a command and control kind of, it's the, the guy who built it is a military guy, and so he lives a military lifestyle and has found people that subscribe to that. Um, and so they've been really successful. They have a winning culture. They're kicking butt all over the place, very militaristically. Hyatt is at the other end of the spectrum where care, which is like, it doesn't have a lot of room. You know, empathy, I think empathy is the connecting, uh, the connective tissue between yeah. all of these things. If you can show up um, as, as being an empathetic person in any situation, that leads to, to winning, but that takes a lot of different forms. So it's, it's hard to, you know, we, we, I guess we have a winning culture. We, we have been winning for a while. Um, we lead with intellectual curiosity, humility, uh, that student mindset that I keep talking about, 
and finding self-starters. We, we really find that people who um, don't need to be told what to do, we want people telling us what to do, is a really nice way to, uh, to build value over time. There's so much about venture that's a team sport, too. Yeah. And Web3 especially has this, uh, you know, we're, we're all going to make it, or, or we're trying to build a better internet to be inclusive and, and um, yeah, uh, uh, transform the power dynamics that's centralizing in certain companies today. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people in this room align towards this responsible innovation. How, how do you unleash the power of you know, Jason, maybe as a final question for Q and A, uh, how, how do you, how do you and your, you know, kind of colleagues think about aligning business and, and, and impact? And, you know, I, 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 I love kind of uh, uh, working with civic leaders like yourself and others in, in the crowd. Of, uh, we we are responsible for our neighbors and, and seeing others flourish as we we generate our success. But we, we'd love to hear your perspectives about this. Too. I'm going to go off script a little bit on this. <laughs> um, I, I think there is, look, we're, we're, we're all, if you're in finance, if you're in venture, um, as a builder, you need to be passionate about what you're doing. Um, on the investor side of things, we're, we're here to help kind of thing. I, I, I get a little bit... Um, I leave a little bit uncomfortable with impact as an organizing principle because that should be the byproduct of product of what you're doing, not the goal of what you're doing, sure. in, my, in my view. Sure. And so the way that you're building out the, the Web3 community in Chicago is going to have a huge impact on Chicago. But if you're not successful, that ecosystem's not going to be successful, or you as the yeah. um, embodiment of everyone in this ecosystem. <laughs> Um, and so I think you have to, uh, at least I think about impact as a byproduct of doing the right thing each day, yeah. being very focused on, on that long-term. Um, um, like leadership by example. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah I, you, you know, we, 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 again, we have a student mindset, but we also have a service provider mindset. Yeah. We're in a weird place where um, we don't build, you know, we, we run a pretty large enterprise with a pretty small team. We have 15 investors. Um, uh, it's growing a little bit, but we have 15 investors, and the way we do that is by decentralizing, empowering the companies that we work with, and in a strange way, like the, you've heard the, the battles won before, before it starts, before you get on the battlefield. Partner selection is so important, yeah. and finding the right people that have that same long-term mindset um, about reinvesting in their businesses, staying through it. You know, we agreed when when we got in business together that we thought over the long term this is going to go from here to here, but in between it's going to go like this, and we're seeing it now. We called it. We called it a couple of years ago. This is not the kind of asset category where you want to be checking your marks every right. day and go nuts with that. Um, and so finding other people that think the same way um, and understand that it's about the journey and kind of. Every bull bear market, every uh, bull market, every bear market, all it's, it's all opportunities to learn. Yeah. It just makes you a stronger person and a stronger partner over time. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, want, want open up for a few questions, if there are any. Ask Paul. <laughs> <laughs> so as the investors, you only as good as your deal flow. Can you touch a bit, a bit on how you guys approach deal flow and how you actually uh, go about selecting or picking a mark that aligns with your principles? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, we're early in venture. On the PE side of things, we've got, so, so the, my grandpa was basically the progenitor of the LBO. He figured out LBO math in the 40s. He grew up in a small business family that was buying three flats and fixing them up and selling them. Uh, and so he grew up with mortgage math and then asked the question, well, why can't I apply that to buying a business? So on the PE side, we've got a great brand, we've got a great network, um, the deal, the pump is primed. On the venture side, uh, we're just getting started there. 
And, and so I'm living that day by day. And the, the truth is, we don't have phenomenal deal flow. In my view right now, we're still getting better at the deal flow. Um, what we are doing, what we kind of have zeroed in on is that, again, long term, the way we're going to create alpha and success is the KPI we're dogmatically focused on is founder MPS. We think if we can consistently add value to our portfolio companies and help our founders in whatever way they need helping, sometimes it's network, sometimes it's kind of institutional wisdom or you know we're kind of we've, we've done it we've seen it pattern recognition sometimes it's hiring people from through our network or through the people we know um, we think that over a long period of time that's what's going to create success and so we're actually doing deal selection right now based on where we think we can add the most value not where we think the best returns are going to be they, I think they, they happen to be the same um, but we're we're going slow in that regard so that we can level up the deal, as we are leveling up the deal flow. Right now, my, my hit rate is too high, and so like, there hasn't been uh, too many deals I've tried to get into that I didn't get into, and so what I've said is, okay, nobody bats a thousand, means we're not looking at the right deals. Um, it's tough as a Midwest family office to break into that coastal institutional VC. That's who we want to be playing against with, you know, I'm still getting used to this Kind of, it takes a village and venture, and PE, somebody wins the deal and somebody loses, and then it's you and the management team. There, there are not 50, 100 people on every cap table. It's not an influence game. Um, and so we're still learning, and along the way, we'll get better at, at deal selection and, and sourcing. But that top of the funnel is not something that we're, I'd say, excellent at yet. But we're working on it. I, at Dexonic, my, my pedigree is from Silicon Valley, so we, we run deal flow like Silicon Valley coastal VCs. Yeah, our, our hit rate is extremely low, much to the chagrin of Danny and Lauren on my investment team, who probably look at 200 deals a week. You know, we, we aggressively go talk to the best founders in the world. We are global investors. And um, you know, I, I think we're very specific about you know, our reputation in, in a bull market, you know, that, that was our priority in marketing last year. It avoided some of the missteps of non unethical people and, and our industry bad actors. Uh, j- just two months ago, we launched our next phase of marketing around substance marketing, and, and that's going to guide our deal flow of, you know, well, let's find the substance, let's get down to the product market fit. Let's understand the details and, and underwrite. Yeah, again, the, the very narrow hit rate that that uh, you know we're, we're uh, underwriting at Dexon. Jason, uh, a comment that you made earlier in your um, in the conversation about you know some uh, you said four early venture partners, a couple that are or staying the course and kind of maybe falling behind, and a couple of others that are adapting. I would just love if you wouldn't mind saying more about that, as especially juxtaposed versus sort of conviction and the bear market. Just how you go about, I don't know, evaluating uh, that I would be super interesting. Um, you know, I would keep it high level. I'd rather not get into some specifics, but but the. Um, Understanding again, this is our, our, our view, right? The paper marks are great for fundraising. They don't feed you in the end, and that's not how we uh, quantify success. And so, what coming out of the pre I, I market at, at August of twenty two when the big correction happened, valuations leading up to that uh, were could, were pretty aggressive. Um, it's hard to stay disciplined enough to say, I want to do what's right for this business, even if that means raising a down round, even if that means taking a flat round or restructuring, but having the ability to focus on the companies as opposed to the fund. You know, I've been learning there's fund strategy and firm strategy, and they're not always the same thing. Um, and so uh, I think those that have focused on the companies and really stay true to, okay, is this a good company? Are the fundamentals still working? What do I need to do in order to make this company a success, whatever portfolio it is? Um, 
is a different way of thinking than, okay, I, you know, I, I'm going to hold on, I'm going to get rid of these, I'm going to hold on tight, and if I can't get an up round, then it's the founder's fault. Um, and, uh, and we've seen a little bit of that. And so it's kind of just adjusting to the new normal uh, more quickly, having that agile mindset. is I'd say that's the kind of organizing principle around what's different. And also, Jason, when, when we were prepping for this panel, you, you said, it, is it okay if I disclose that you, know, you slow down your investment pacing to five-year yes. pacing? You know, and we had gone to market with a two-and-a-half year, three-year pacing, and, and we slowed it down. And incrementally, you've done it incrementally. You've kind of assessed, reassessed, reevaluated, and, and and from a adjusted. GP side, similar to a founder side, you know, I, I want to preempt those conversations. If, if I were in my LP shoes, my board member's shoes, you know, what what would they expect? And, and if you're really dedicated towards substance, you know, something like an investment pacing is such an easy relax. It, it's such an easy communication to share with your yeah. investor because you, you, you are building with substance and you're trying to build durable businesses and you're not trying to raise the next fund so quickly yeah. and, and try and get money out the door. Yeah, vintaging is way more important in venture. It, it is in PE as well, but it, it isn't as apparent as right. quickly. And so I really I applauded Paul um, and, and just think that we do, not everybody has done that to, to go from two years to or two, three years to to five years and slow down investment pace and wait, be patient, wait for the, the, the fat pitches and the ones, the great companies, great founders. Um, it's some people love fundraising, right? Yeah, and they that's just right. want to be that's in the right. market and kind yeah. of get, get that laddering effect going. Yep. And, um, so that's a little bit of the difference. Maybe one last question. Well, like the, the point that you made at the beginning about AI being a force of the air for the industry, where we be? It's really poignant because you know you look at how generative AI has just exploded in the last six months, and obviously a lot of investment has gone into AI to build transformers and all of this fundamental research. The question is, with this sort of product market fit and market metrics sort of focused now, is there room for investment in fundamental Web three technologies being? that it is still so nascent. There's obviously still a lot that needs to be learned at the fundamental level where you may not have that sort of application. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at the durable use cases at the intersection of AI and Web3. And I'm happy to go extremely deep into this area because it's been such a three-month OKRs around becoming best-in-class uh, of this thought leadership. We believe Web3 has the business models for online exponential growth in AI. Uh, we, we believe all our portfolio companies should deploy AI to improve capital efficiency and cash generation. Yeah, well, yeah. A lot of terms in there. I want to get it out quickly, but this is something that I think we are in a moment of time uh, unleashing AI. It's such a horizontal technology that it does impact our Web3 you know, operations, our, how we go to market. Um, not easy, not a one-size-fits-all. It, it's something that, you know, I think when, when we step outside of our domain and understand the use cases, it's, it, it's easier to get to the nuance very quickly. You know? yeah, but certainly there, there are fundamental aspects of AI that coincide with Web3 that could accelerate tremendous durability of this. You know, as a venture investor, you're always looking for the next product cycle. How, how long does a product cycle perish? You know, everything will decay. Now, now it's a question of, does it decay over 20 years, like a mortgage or, or a bank or, or, a, or a soft business or something? You know, versus like product cycles of gaming could perish over three weeks, three months. You know, it, it's a ruthless business that you know, uh, technologists have to stay in, in front of. So, um, our, our underwriting is generally around perishability or durability of use cases, and, and AI is starting to rejigger that formula very quickly. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks I appreciate it. Thank you.